Our Father, we uh, do join with the words uh, penned by King David so long ago in Psalm 116. I love you, Lord. I love the Lord because he heard my cries for mercy. And therefore, I will call upon him all the days of my life. Uh, Father, as a uh, collection of believers, men, women, children who have professed faith in you, uh, even though we do not see you, we love you. And even though we do not see you now, we believe in you and we are filled with joy, an inexpressible joy that is filled with glory. Thank you, Lord, that we join with believers of all generations uh, who have that longing of the human heart uh, fulfilled in the very person and the work of Jesus, the one whom we love and the one day we get to see face to face. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity today to now gather, not only in worship, but under the authority of your word. Uh, speak now, Lord, through your word. May you accomplish the purpose for which you are sending it today. Work in our hearts uh, that we may grow up into our salvation. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. New hope. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, worship team, uh, men and women, uh, thank you for your service uh, to us today. Uh, and good morning to you, New Hope. I love you guys too. And good morning to all of you who are joining us uh, in the online community. Uh, immediately following uh, the sermon and uh, worship song today at the end, uh, we would encourage you to stay. We have a very important and critical update regarding our youth pastor search and the youth center, both of those if you're part of the New Hope family and you've been praying for those, uh, we wanna make sure that you have a very good update. He was a one boy insurgency. Some of you had boys like that. He had a temper so wild that his mom could not corral him and spankings didn't help him. Uh, bullies didn't help. Uh, harsh words that would pierce his soul and as a kid growing with resentment and bitterness uh, by the way, he could steal anything, and he did. It was said that if it could be eaten, he would steal it. Uh, he would steal from friends and neighbors. Uh, he would steal cakes right off of kitchen tables. He would steal kegs as he grew older. Uh, this was a boy that could steal anything. And, and, and the, the anger and the resentment, the temper that would build, he, he turned it into a boxing career in his teen years where he would uh, take his fists and he would uh, pummel people. This boy could not be corralled. His life would ter take a, a turn, uh, a turn of events. Uh, he was about 24 years old and, and, and the turn of events like many young American boys uh, happened uh, when the little small island in the Pacific was bombed by the Japanese in 1941, which uh, sent this boy off to war. He joined the army, and his story is told in the well-known bestseller, Unbroken. By the way, the book is way better than the movie. Uh, he was playing that he was flying in over the Pacific, crashed uh, in the middle of the ocean, killing eight men instantly and leaving three alive. Louis was one of them. Now just imagine, imagine being uh, stuck in an emergency life raft surrounded by sharks that are waiting for you with ocean in every direction, uh, living off of rainwater and enduring days and days drifting at sea. Imagine uh, living that way for six days and then seven days and then 14 days. Imagine being drifting at sea with no hope for 21 days and then 30 days and then 40, get this, for 47 days drifting at sea. And imagine how you would feel when you finally see land. Wouldn't you be happy? They were and they rejoiced. Only to find that it was controlled by the Japanese who took him prisoner and beat him mercilessly for 42 more days and then transferred him off to a POW camp in Japan where he would endure over a year of merciless torture and persecution and sufferings and beatings. Meanwhile, back home, 
In the States, he was considered lost at sea originally, and then as months turned into over a year, he was pronounced killed in action. Even his parents received a letter from the president saying that your son has died. Oh, but he was very much alive. And the torture and the beatings that he endured uh, proved that he was alive as he was being uh, dehumanized and every ounce of dignity was being taken from him by the merciless torture. And it wouldn't be until the end of the war that this POW camp was found and Louis was physically alive, but he was emotionally broken. He went back home to Los Angeles where he would hopefully begin a recovery process, but that did not turn out well at all. That's when his life became unraveled. Uh, He was coming undone, tearing apart at the seams, emotionally ripping apart. Uh, Nightmares, every single night of tortures and beatings would wake him up and sweating and cursing and he was a danger to himself, to society, to his new wife. He would turn to alcohol to try to drown the, the memories and the trauma of war, but nothing he would do could free him from captivity. Here was a man that for five years, he was a free man, but he was still a captive uh, to the emotional trauma of war. 1949 comes along. A 31-year-old preacher uh, goes to Los Angeles to do a multi-week tent revival. Do you remember those old tent revivals? Uh, Louis's wife decided to go with a friend, and while at the tent revival, she gave her heart to the Lord. She became born again. She couldn't wait to get home. She goes home, and she tells Louis all about it, urging, pleading, begging for him to come back to the tent revival meeting. How do you think that conversation went? Louis wanted nothing to do. He absolutely would not go. It was a multi-day argument. Spouses, have you ever had one? multi-day argument, and finally, well, the persistence of a wife can be more persuasive than the pain of prison. And finally, Louis agreed to go. They go to this tent revival meeting. He wanted nothing to do with God, and he wanted even less to do with this strange preacher with a North Carolina accent named Billy Graham. He wouldn't go any further than the back row. He sat in the back row angry and sullen as Billy Graham uh, preached that night. He says, here tonight is a drowning man lost in the sea of life. And as he heard Billy's words, he got more angry and more perturbed and he just wanted to leave for the exit. And finally, Billy said, every head bow, every eye closed. They closed the service and he left, angry. They went home that night. His wife pleaded with him, would you go back again? Would you go back tomorrow? How do you think that conversation went? It led to a multi-hour argument between husband and wife, and finally, Louis said, fine, I'll go back on one condition. When that preacher says, every head bowed, every eye closed, we're out of there. And so they go back the next day. Throughout the whole sermon, it felt like God had him under a microscope. He was restless. He wanted to punch somebody. Uh, he, was, uh, he was on the verge, on the edge of explosion. He just, and then he heard the words, every head bowed, every eye closed. He grabbed his wife. He pushed past the people in his row. He's running for the exit door when he hears Billy Graham say these words, nobody leaving. You can leave when I'm preaching, but not now. And he stops in the aisle. And my friend, I'm telling you, In that moment, as the story is told, a memory flooded his mind, I believe certainly by the Holy Spirit, that brought him back to the middle of the sea when he was drifting. In the moment when he was dying, surrounded by sharks, ocean in every direction, the memory hit him in the aisle at that moment that he remembers mouthing the words to the Lord, if you save me, I will serve you forever. And in that moment, Louis stops and he turns around and he faces Billy Graham and he walks the aisle to give his life to Jesus Christ as Lord. Do you know what happened? The chains began to fall immediately. He went home, went to the liquor cabinet and took all of the liquor out and dumped it down the drain and he says along with it, the desire for it was gone. 
That night, for the first time in five years, he had no nightmares whatsoever of torture or terror, and they never returned again. And as for the rage and the resentment and the bitterness that had built, it had been replaced by love and forgiveness, a love and forgiveness that was so compelling that he could even forgive his captors who had tormented him. As it says, here is his testimony uh, in the end of the book. He says, in a single silent moment, his rage, his fewer fear, his humiliation and helplessness had fallen away. That morning, he believed he was a new creation. Softly, he wept. Isn't the power of the gospel amazing? I mean, the power of the gospel that can, that can intersect into our lives, that can transform trauma, that can heal brokenness, that can cleanse our rage, that can restore joy, that can enter into the deepest wounds of the soul and cause us to get this, to be born again, and not just born again, but new creations, transformed and set free. That's the good news that Peter declares about in 1 Peter chapter one. Listen to the words of Peter. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For the grass withers and the flower fades, or for all flesh is like grass, rather. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory uh, like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So... Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn children. Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. First Peter chapter one through two. Give God a round of applause for his word caused us to be born again. Listen, here it is. Uh, God gives new birth. Peter calls this to mind. He says, since you have been born again, have you, uh, have you been born again? Peter heard this phrase from Jesus himself, born again. Uh, it's, a, it's a word, it's a phrase that is so misunderstood uh, by many people. It's even mocked by some people in culture, this idea of being born again. In fact, there's even t-shirts and bumper stickers that have uh, this phrase, I was born okay the first time. Uh, however, the scripture offers a much different narrative, doesn't it, of the human condition. Uh, the, the condition is that we were not born okay the first time, that we are born captive of sin, that we, are, uh, we may be free individuals. However, we are held captive and in bondage to this sinful nature. Born again, we are broken and desperate need of a savior, which is why Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus that one day in the very famous chapter of John chapter three, he said that unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Certainly this must have been part of Jesus' teaching, his narrative, because Peter uh, likely overheard it. He learned it, and he is the only other uh, person in the scripture to use the phrase that we are born again. Chapter one, we are born again to a living hope through, the, through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And here, he reminds believers that you've been born again. Isn't that great? Uh, you're a new creation. What does it mean? It means that you have a new start, uh, a, new, uh, a new path of life. Uh, you were once dead, now you're alive. You start over in the things of the faith. You've been born again. You've, you've been made new. You're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. It reminds me uh, of the powerful two-word testimonies that came in from New Hope people several months ago as people testified of what, of what God had done in their life and summarized their entire life narrative in different ways. And here's the New Hope people. Uh, they've been buried to reborn. They went from confused to informed, from unloved to cherished, from depressed to cheerful, from dispirited to unburdened. 
from arrogance to submission, from dead to alive, from insignificant to significant, from selfish to servant, from pride to purpose, from alone to chosen, from trapped to free. These are your stories. And I wonder what your two-word testimony would be about this new creation. Isn't, isn't it the power of the gospel amazing? I mean, uh, to, to truly enter into the life, into the captivity of the human heart, and to set one free. No, we were not born okay the first time. We have need of being born again to a living hope through the resurrection, which calls to mind a very different saying. Perhaps you've heard this. uh, Those born once will die twice, and those born twice will die once. Think of it. As believers in Jesus Christ having been born again, yes, we will die one day, all but we shall live forever with the King of glory. You have been born again. It is God who causes the new birth. And how does he do this? Peter answers the question. He does it through his word. Take a look at this. Uh, He does uh, this new birth through his word. Notice this verse right here. When Peter says, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord, what does it do? Remains forever. He's quoting uh, one of his favorite books of the Bible. Here it is, Isaiah. Loves Isaiah. He calls to mind Isaiah chapter 40, this great passage of scripture which calls to mind the power and the authority of the word of the Lord. Uh, The word of God, listen, it's not like the grass, it's not like flowers which begin to fade and die the moment you cut them. The the word of the Lord rather is, uh, it's imperishable, it's living, it's eternal, it's good news. It is warranted never to fail. God's word. Last week, um, uh, as, as things were uh, unfolding in Israel, uh, one of New Hope's missionaries that we support is in Israel, and they reported that over 30 rockets went over their head. Every single one was intercepted by the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome, which is there to intercept and defend against the missile attacks and bring them down. And in a very real sense, Peter is saying that the word of the Lord is the true and better Iron Dome. It protects, it gives life, it guards, it's imperishable. It it infuses new life into people and it is sure and certain it endures forever. The grass withers, the flower falls, but listen, the word of the Lord, it will endure forever. Now, that's a truth that uh, is a courage. It's, it, it's comforting. Uh, one man uh, back in the Isaiah series, when we covered that passage that, I, that Peter references here, uh, one man in our congregation said this, the powerful imagery of Isaiah 40 rang through my mind. Our current culture came to mind. What, what with the censorship of free speech, the pressure to limit and control worship, the culture takes comfort in its Google search and big tech, he writes, But the remnant will always be comforted by this fact, the word of our God will stand forever. This is what Peter calls to mind. God gives new birth and he does it through his word. That word is living, it's abiding, it endures forever. Uh, It's not like humanity, it's not like cut grass, it's not like the flowers of the field, but it indeed endures forever. And Peter says in verse 25, and this word, is the good news that was preached to you. That good news uh, that gets preached to us, uh, for some of us, that good news comes from a mom or a dad. For me, it was in 1984. The good news delivered from a mom to a boy in a kitchen. It was a month after the Detroit Tigers won the World Series and I knew that God deserved praise. And mom explained to me the problem of sin, the need for a savior, the death of Christ, the resurrection, and led me in a prayer where I knelt on that orange, ugly carpet in the kitchen. The good news was preached to me. For others, it comes through a preacher. It reminds me of a man here in the church. He's 81 years old now, a retired gentleman. 
He says that God was pursuing him through the 50s. In northern Michigan, he was on vacation. He remembers that God was pursuing him. God pursued him in the 60s when he was in the army. God pursued him into his young career in the 60s when he was a CPA in Ohio. And all along, this man was resisting God. He wanted to do life his own way. It was the late 60s, he was on a business trip. Uh, He was staying at a motel in Noblesville, Indiana. He still remembers it like it was yesterday. He got done with this um, long business day and he checks into the hotel just north of Indianapolis and, uh, and, and he goes to the TV and he turns it on. By the way, there was no Netflix in the late 60s. There was no cable. There's three stations. Folks, do you remember those days? He turned to all three stations, and all three stations had that crazy North Carolina tent revival preacher named Billy Graham on. And so he watched it. And in that hotel room in Noblesville, Indiana, that 20-some-year-old young businessman knelt on the ground, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. He writes about that moment, or he told me yesterday, He said it was like a great awakening. The presence of the Lord was so vivid, I was afraid to open my eyes because he was standing there. And this is over 50 years ago. That man and his wife, their lives have been changed. When he got home from the business trip, his wife, who was not a believer yet, she said she knew from the moment he came home that something was different. And that's the power of the gospel. That is God's word. It tells of a savior who defeated death. He reverses decay. He raises bodily. Uh, That message comes to us through the living and the abiding word of God. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it never loses its power. He gives new birth, church, doesn't he? He's done it with you. And it comes through his word And that word calls us to grow up. Uh, This call to grow up. uh, Do you know that when you're born again, the work's not done, right? I hope you all know that. There's things that he calls us to stop and things he calls us to start. This is the idea here that Peter gets into. Now that you've been born again, uh, that you are infants, now you're in stages of growth and there's things that you gotta put off, you gotta stop doing. There's things that you gotta start doing. Uh, And this is what Peter reminds these believers of, that it's time to grow up. Think of it like spring cleaning. Out with the old, in with the new. These changes of life, uh, the growth of uh, of, of the Christian life, uh, uh, for some people, it is instantly and dramatically. Some of you have that story where the moment you're born again, things immediately drop off. Uh, for others of you, that process is slow and gradual. It's called, big word, ready? Sanctification. And this seems to be what's in Peter's mind when he calls these believers uh, uh, to put away certain things. He says to put away what? All malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and, uh, and all slander. Uh, not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination. But what Peter calls to mind is that there's a, there, there's a pattern of... Be- Listen, if you checked out, check in. Here it is. There's a pattern of behavior and speech as believers in Jesus Christ that no longer go with your new life. It reminds me of a story of two Irish immigrants, a young boy and a young girl who were dating in New York City back in the 1930s. And these two Irish immigrants were standing on the Brooklyn Bridge overlooking the East River. And that young man looked at the young girl and she, he noticed a ring was on her finger. And he said, uh, hey, what's that ring from? And she said, well, it was from an old boyfriend. He gave it to me. And he says, really, do you mind if I see that? She gave him the ring and he tosses it in the East River. And he says to her, you will no longer be needing that. In that spirit, Peter says to the believers here uh, who have been born again, he says, regarding some of those old things of the old nature, those old attachment, you'll no longer be needing those. And he says to cast it, put it away, drop it into the deepest part 
of East Bay. And now, as infants, just like infants who crave milk, he says, turn your cravings and your longings and begin to grow in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. As chance would have it, on Friday we were having lunch in Glen Arbor and at a table next to us uh, was a family with a boy, not an infant, but about one year old. And that infant, uh, that one year old or so, had two sippy cups in front of him on the table. <laughs> Ever seen an infant do that? <laughs> and Peter says, like newborn infants, Long for pure spiritual mouth, craving, craving, eager. And then he ends with a very strange phrase, translated differently in many Bibles. Verse three, ESV, what's this? Read it. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The NIV, read this. Now, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Holman Christian, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now we can arm wrestle later on what the better translation is. Uh, if you have tasted, since you have tasted, or now that you have tasted, we can arm wrestle about, the, uh, uh, about what word belongs here, but don't miss the big point. Listen, he's saying it's time to grow up in your salvation since, now that, if you indeed have tasted that God is good. His big point here is that the goodness of God is so big and so massive that once you taste of it, once you are born again to a living hope through the resurrection, once you taste of his goodness, there is an endless reservoir of goodness from which to taste from that we are to continue to long for and crave for and, and soak in. If you have tasted that God is good, then it's time to grow up. Since you have tasted that God is good, then it's time to soak it in. Peter is calling to mind the great verse out of Psalms, which says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That verse is the life verse of one New Hope member, and he's a chef. He came fresh out of culinary school many years ago, and a master chef uh, told him to taste a recipe that he had made. So this young culinary student uh, uh, takes a spoon and he dips it in the pot and he blows on it a few times and he puts it in his mouth, he swallows it and he says to the chef, it's good. And the master chef says, no, no, do it again. And this time when you put it in your mouth, move it around examine it, check for the flavors, and tell me what ingredients are in there. This young culinary student dips a spoon in again, blows on it, puts it in his mouth, he moves it around, he examines it, he checks for the flavors, and he says all of a sudden, he begins to identify the ingredients and what time went into it and what preparation, and he says in that moment, this verse began to help him understand the Bible and understand the character of God. That so often, isn't it true, that we just don't take time to savor and test and examine and move the word around our mouth and in our mind and, and to see the goodness emerge and, and to see the glory of God unveiled. It was this verse, and this man from New Hope says this, when I read that verse, taste and see, seeing God took on a whole new meaning. God chose the word taste for a specific reason, he wants us to try the goodness he has created, inspect the quality and time he took to make everything with such care and thought. And Peter says to you, believer, if you've been born again, take time to taste and see that the Lord is good. Savor it, examine it. See how big and awesome and recapture the awe and the wonder of who God is and what he's done in your life to set the captives free. God causes the new birth, doesn't he? He does it through the word. It's living and abiding, and he calls us to grow up. That's the message of 1 Peter. It's a beautiful message, isn't it? 
Somebody online said, yeah. yeah that's... <laughs> Action steps. What do we do with this? Uh, this is critical right here. Sever something that belongs to your old nature. I, I struggled with, with what word. I, I, I was thinking sever some tie to the old nature, sever some attachment uh, from the old nature. Uh, so I just left something. Sever something. Uh, some a tie, some attachment. I love that phrase, uh, spoke on that East River Bridge. You won't be needing that anymore. I think Peter is trying to tell the believers in Jesus Christ, listen, you've been born again. Uh, it's time to put away all malice and all, well, let's take a look at them real quick. Here's what he says, to put away malice. What is that? It's internal anger. It's an unforgiving spirit, by the way. This comes out in road rage. It comes out in impatience with strangers. Not just words, but deeds. I got flipped off a week ago again when I was driving. <laughs> now imagine if I had retaliated in the, in the same way. Wouldn't you say that that would not be good, right? Probably. But malice comes out when you're driving. Deceit, it's trying to trick or use a decoy or con people. Trying to Pretend to be something you're not, which is hypocrisy as well. It's acting apart, it's pretending. Envy, it's jealousy, it's wanting what others have and not being content with what you do have. Slander, it's verbal attacks, backbiting. It happens in relationships, at the workplace, and in families. And Peter says, you won't be needing those things anymore. It's time to grow up. It's time to put those aside. Is there an addiction you have, an attitude a heart condition uh, that is full of unforgiveness or bitterness? Is there impatience? Is, is there road rage? You won't be needing that anymore. You're born again. Today, a practical action step would be to make a decisive action to pray, to surrender that to the Lord, repent of it for sure, but then ask for his strength to overcome it. Does he not have the power to transform? Absolutely. He's caused you to go from dead to alive. How uh, does he not also have the power to set you free from those things and to sever the ties from those old things of life? Second action step would be to stop grumbling and savor God's goodness. Uh, I, I just love the word grumble. Everybody just kind of say grumble like five times, ready? Grumble, 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 grumble. Isn't that a great word? And don't we all do it? Grumble. Complain. When instead we should have a heart full of thankfulness, a spirit of gratitude for all that God has done, to taste and see that God has been so good to us. That chef who was transformed by that, by that uh, phrase, by that word of the scripture, he writes this, what would happen if we tasted the goodness of God and then see what he has for us in those moments? What would it look like if today and then all this week you began to reframe your thinking instead of wanting a, a bigger house or a second house or a lake house, how about being grateful for the house that God has given you? Instead of uh, complaining or grumbling about the road and the traffic and, and how stupid drivers are, how about be grateful that you have extra time in the car to observe the beauty of northern Michigan? My wife made a, a tray of Rice Krispie treats yesterday. I love Rice Krispie treats. I came downstairs last night, couldn't sleep, and I wanted a Rice Krispie treat, but, and there it was gone. But then I saw one. Uh, uh, it was uh, on the floor under the cupboard, a whole Rice Krispie treat. And my first thought was, what idiot drops a Rice Krispie on the floor and leaves? That's my first thought, what idiot? And then I thought, there's one left. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I mean, you gotta reframe your thinking. I mean, you have to shift uh, the thinking instead of the complaining, the grumbling, what idiot. There's one left. Stop grumbling. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Third action step. Let Christ in and then watch the chains fall. 
Uh, Jesus Christ still has the power uh, to break every chain that holds you prisoner. Uh, he will go to Noblesville, Indiana. He will go to 1984 in a kitchen. He will go to the middle of the ocean. He'll go to a Japanese POW camp. He'll go to a tent revival meeting. He'll go right here. And he'll enter in, not just to give new birth, but to transform you. And then the chains begin to fall. The day after Louis had given his life to the Lord at a tent revival meeting, he says he woke up feeling cleansed. For the first time in five years, the nightmares were gone. That morning, he found a Bible in his old uh, duffel bag that had been uh, sent back when he was um, from the army, uh, along with the notice that your son Louis is dead. He found that Bible, and he went to a park. He sat under a tree, and he began to read the Bible. And it was that morning. It says this in the book. It says, what resonated with him was not all that he had suffered, but the divine love that had saved him. He was not a worthless, broken, forsaken man. He was a new creation. And the chains begin to fall. Pastor Rick is gonna come on up and we're gonna uh, hear a song about that, about the chains beginning to fall. Uh, the, the transformation of the Holy Spirit. Listen to these lyrics. Here it is. These lyrics that are gonna say things like this. Once in darkness, now in light. Once blind, now I see. Once a sinner, now a saint. Once bound, now free. Once a stranger, now a child. Empty, now filled. Once condemned, now reconciled, broken, now healed. Once a prodigal, now home. Once lost, now found. Once an enemy, now a friend. Once poor, now crowned. That's the power of the cross. See the chains fall. Isn't the power of the gospel amazing? And Peter says, since you've been born again through the living and abiding word of God, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. Take your life Surrender it to the Lord, the trials, the troubles, and watch the chains fall.